Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 165, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And welcome to this week's show. Now, uh, we did say weekly, this podcast comes out every single Friday, and the aim of it is that we like to kind of let you know what's happening in the world of retro gaming, which people always think, how can there be new stuff happening in retro? There is all the time. And if you check us out, you can go to retrohour.com. You can listen to us through iTunes, Stitcher, um, Audio Boom, so many different services. But also you can check us on YouTube as well. Yeah, so we're all over the place. And every week, Ravi, I and Joe, Joe's often here as well when he can, you know, tear himself away <laughs> from, from his rock and roll lifestyle on the road. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> Endless groupies and everything. Uh, but we like to bring you up to speed on what's been happening this week. For example, I mean, retro gaming is so big at the moment. There's actually going to be a movie about Sonic the Hedgehog that's going to be out this summer that's had a bit of a mixed reaction from what we've seen so far of it. We'll talk about that in a minute. And also, the last blockbuster store in the world. It's down to one. We'll talk about that in just a bit. And every week on the podcast, we bring you a special guest as well. Now, the guy we've got this week is really interesting. We met him at Play Expo in Manchester, didn't we, a couple of years ago? Yeah, I think this is the first comedian we've had on the podcast. And this guy is absolutely hilarious. He's John Robertson, and he's basically done a game called The Dark Room. So this game is based on a text adventure. On stage, you have random choices. I think you can win £10,000 yeah. or something like that. And he hosts it around the world. So he's doing different events around the world. He's also hosted on Video Game Nation, which was a massive TV show. And he also faked a heart attack on uh, Australia's Got Talent <laughs> as well. So. I need to get on this. <laughs> <laughs> well, the dark room, it's actually coming back to uh, Play Expo in Manchester. Yeah. Where, of course, we're going to be. All us guys will be there. We'll be hosting our retro our stage. Um, doing this podcast live, essentially, across the weekend. So if you want to get tickets for that, there will be in our show notes at theretrohour.com, happening over the first May Bank holiday weekend. John's going to be there as well, doing the Dark Room Live, but also it's not just a stage show. It started on YouTube, didn't it? Where it got really big, and now he's doing a video game as well. Yeah, so he's actually got a Steam game which is coming out. This interview is great because he kind of talks about those early text adventures and you know how unfair they often were as well because he plays a baddie in the game actually John doesn't he so it's a really interesting chat like I said the first comedian we've had on he's a really good storyteller John Robertson from The Dark Room is going to be our guest on the Retro Hour podcast in around 15 minutes from now if you love text adventures and those do you remember those choose your own adventure stories yeah kind yeah. of heavily influenced by that as well now before we get into that and the news this week let's give a big mention to our favourite people the people who allow us to continue doing the Retro Hour podcast for you every single week Allow us to put on events, keep the show going, get a flashy new website, all Studio that Studio costs. Everything. Exactly, yeah. So we really appreciate any help Ferraris. we can get, guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's just you, Joe, and your, your rock and roll lifestyle. You know, keep going back to that. How's the band going at the moment? Uh, it's all good, yeah. Apparently we're driving Ferraris in yeah. <laughs> rock and roll lifestyle. <laughs> just don't tell your bandmates. Yeah, yeah. Just me. <laughs> yeah, there's kids' ones from Asda. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly what it is. <laughs> Ravi and I don't drive a Ferrari yet, so that, that's why your help is appreciated. <laughs> so if you would like to make a donation into the running of the show, any amount, we say, you know, all the time, a penny, a pound, a dollar, a euro... Anything we get into the running of the show really makes a difference. And for doing that, you will earn your place in the very prestigious, in fact, the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming, the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Like this week... Baltej Pandia. Matthew Casey. Kevin Lee. And Matthew Martin. Who all made donations into the running of the show. And if you'd like to do the same, you'll find that link. Little PayPal button. Click on the supported section on our shiny new website at theretrohour.com. Also the same place as well if you'd like to claim this incredible offer. Now, I think it's fair to say looking around the room, lads, we'll enjoy a swift little beer every now and then. Are you looking at my beer guts? <laughs> I, was, I was literally about to say my belly does enjoy this. <laughs> beer and snacks. Is there a better combination while you play oh, games? no, not at all. Which is why this week... We're so pleased that our good friends at Beer 52 are back on board and supporting this week's edition of the Retro Hour podcast. Now, we've got, I think this is one of the coolest things we've ever given you a chance to get. As a listener to the Retro Hour, we've got together with Beer 52 to give you a free case of craft beer. And snacks. And snacks as well. <laughs> and a magazine, if you want to find out more about beer. So I actually, I've been checking this out over the last couple of months. Um, I've got, you know, I signed up for this, got a couple. And it's really interesting looking through this magazine. I didn't realise that how badly I wanted to be a beer connoisseur. 
until I started reading through this. I'm like, wow, it's actually really like, cool. Wow, this is how they make beer? Yeah, like. such an interesting <laughs> read. Now, if you'd like to get your own free case, all you have to do is head to beer52.com forward slash retro to claim a free case. And it really is a perfect chance to get some extra special beers in because Beer 52, they're the world's most popular monthly craft beer discovery club. So what they do is... They do it all for you. They search out incredible and exclusive small batch craft beers from the world's greatest breweries and bring them back to their members. So it's not the stuff you're going to find in your local supermarket. And every month it's something different as well. Now, I've been looking through what they've been doing recently. They've got stuff like, um, <laughs> we were talking about this last week, Mango Milkshake IPA by Tiny Rebel in Wales. There's one called Mount Salive from France as well. Really something for everyone's taste. I mean, Ravi, you're, you're quite like dark beers, don't you? Yeah, yeah, but that mango one sounds interesting because... Mm. IPA is like Indian pale ale, yeah. and mango lassi is like an Indian drink as well, which is kind of like mango milkshake. So there's a nice connection there. We can do like, you know, mixed cases. Well, if you like lighter beers, do like a light case, they yeah. do a dark case, whatever you want, you mix it up. So if you want to get your first case, all you have to do, the case is free. You just have to pay £5.95 postage, and you will get eight incredible craft beers. They're for Mint Magazine and a snack included with next day shipping. You were saying before, Joe, like, what a good bargain that is. Well, the thing is, I actually thought it was six. <laughs> yeah. So I was eight. just like, oh, eight. Yeah. It sorts your Saturday night out, your Friday night out, uh, night out, night in, in fact. Literally, there's nothing better than just sitting there in the games room, in the front room, Xbox on, or your Mega Drive on, couple of beers, pack of pork scratchings or something. Like, that just sounds bliss to me. That is all the weekends about, <laughs> That is literally it? the weekend. <laughs> like, so there is no minimum commitment. You can just take the free case if you want, try the beer, see what you think. If it's not for you, pause and cancel at any time. All you have to do to claim your free case today is head to their website, beer52.com forward slash retro. And also, you'll get your free case in the post and you'll be helping out this podcast as well. Can't say better than that. Now, let's talk about this live action Sonic movie. Now... Joe, our resident Sega fan, have you seen this picture that's been leaked that apparently shows what Sonic the Hedgehog is going to look like in this new film? So I didn't believe it. I seen it and I was like, oh, you know when you just see something, you're just in a bit of a disbelief and I just like, yeah, that, that's just something, some fan-made, fan art kind of stuff. And then like, you start seeing it popping around a bit more and you start seeing all these memes and then you're like, yo, wait, what's going on here? <laughs> like, is this real? <laughs> well, describe how he looks. Um, he looks like a child. That's like, and he just doesn't look in proportion. And it's just, I don't know. Just, yeah, I don't know what you expect though, because most video game movies are rubbish. Like, well, well, I, I, you know what? I love a good cheesy video game movie. Like, I love, uh, I you, love Mario, you like Bros. Mario. You like I Mario, Bros. Okay. Mario Bros. I love Mario Bros. I love Mortal Kombat. Not Mortal even Kombat. Tomb Raider. Did like, you? I've not seen it actually. Oh, yeah. uh, oh no, wait. The, I've seen the first two. I've not seen yeah. the new one. Um, don't love them so much. But, like, I'm definitely going to go see it at the cinema when it comes out. But I feel really sorry for him. Like, yeah. I'm looking at it and I don't love it. And I'm just like, I, re- I feel really bad for Sonic because I love Sonic so much. Well, someone said here, they made Sonic the Hedgehog look like a mascot for a disease in a pharmaceutical ad. <laughs> <laughs> well... The way that I've seen Sonic is he's he's been forever cheapened for years. And I remember going to Poundland a few years ago and seeing all this Sonic merchandise everywhere. And I knew that was the end for Sonic. That was you know? it. He was done. He's in Poundland. He's in Poundland now with Thunderbirds and a few <laughs> others. Well, I'll put he was this... skating on thin ice when he was in McDonald's and Burger King, but now... <laughs> in the bargain bit at Poundland. Yeah. Well, there's an article here on NME and they've embedded some amazing tweets. Scroll down a little bit. First look at Tales from Sonic. I, that cracked me up. Well, oh, Gosh, yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, fans have actually done kind of fixes on this image that make Sonic look a lot better. And this is fans who've actually taken it in Photoshop. And look at the comparisons. There's a guy there called uh, Gupinas who's done it. And it looks a lot better than the version from the movie. So it makes you think if they, you know, fans can do it and make him look a lot more authentic to Sonic. I think it's the eyes. He's just Yeah, the eyebrows, I'm thinking. He's just fixed it like... And the thing is, like, the comments are like, I did this on my lunch break at yeah. work. And it's just like... It's, it's weird, though. I'm finding this new CGI, you know, when they say they're doing, like, a live-action version of Jungle Book, or they're it's doing not, this... It's not it, live-action. And they all look freaky. Liking. Like Liking. most of the, you know, Man, what's going on there? <laughs> most, most of the CGI, though, they, they look kind of odd between human and animal. And yeah, they're like, right. you know... Oh, it's weird, isn't it? Have you guys been watching the new series of Alan Partridge? Yeah. I yeah, love the episode where he went back to school and had his CGI face on last night. Yeah, yeah. That 
that cracked me up when I was watching that. So, yeah, CGI can be done right, but I think you're right, Joe. Look at his, his eyes are too small. Yeah, they're too small. They've not done the the one eye thing. Some people will know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, like, well, yeah, it's yeah. actually split above his nose. Yeah, it's split it? above his yeah. nose, yeah. and he's got he's still got the white above there. They haven't they haven't done that. These images they fix that. So yeah, we'll see what the final image looks like. Have we got any sort of ETA when the film's coming out? Uh, November this year, apparently. November so this year. You'd imagine it's probably oh, pretty much on its way to being yeah, finished. Yeah, I was going to say gonna... they're not fixing that. <laughs> <laughs> they're not fixing that. Start over. <laughs> redo the whole film based on these tweets. So if you want to check out those pictures, if you haven't seen them yet, I'll put them in the show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, one thing that we love doing on this show is uh, covering projects that we find really interesting. And every week, you know, we check out Kickstarter and find out the best cool retro projects that are happening right now. And uh, this one is so cool. Now, this is actually a board game inspired by retro video games. Bit of a kind of cyberpunk kind of atmosphere going on. And the game has actually made the graphics on Deep Paint on the Amiga. Yeah, and the sound as well. He's done a, a little soundtrack with Pro Tracker. It's a kind of single-player immersive game. So let's have a little word with James. Hello, James Bradley. Welcome to the show. Hello, hi. Thank you very much for having me on. I've been an avid listener since the very, very beginning. Oh, that amazing. So well, it's great that we can um, help support your project as well because um, this is a board game called, now let me try and say this name, <laughs> Civitas Nihelium. Bang on. That's it, exactly. And the thing that I really liked about this is you've actually use D-Paint and Sound Tracker on your original Amiga 1200 to help yeah. design this game. Yeah, that was the that was the thing that I really wanted to kind of like do. I ever since ever since getting the the Amiga back from my mum's loft about about I don't know, maybe maybe about 5 years ago, 5 or 6 years ago, and like listening to your podcast and kind of cons- consuming all the all the new retro content that's coming out there. I've like tried, I tried my hardest to learn basic or Amos um, through Amos the creator and stuff. I really wanted to like make a game on the Amiga. And I just suddenly thought, you know what, actually, what am I doing? I can, I can, I can use Photoshop. I'm sure I could learn D paint and I'm sure I could do pixel art and I'm sure I can do like, I've done loads of stuff with FL studio and things like that before in the past. So I, Got a copy of Music X, got a copy of Soundtrack of Pro, got a new copy of, well, not a new copy of Deluxe Paint, but got a copy of Deluxe Paint and just gave it all a go and thought, yeah, let's pretend I'm a graphic designer slash board game designer in the early 90s and let's see if I can make a board game. Well, this game's quite unique because it's set in a cyberpunk world, which, of yeah. course, we all love from Amiga because I was, you know, playing Syndicate on my own and I was kind Ooh. of immersed in all these cyberpunk worlds. Also, um, Beneath the Steel Sky was a fantastic one as yeah. well. Oh, it's the best. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah, um, it's a brilliant game. What's the difference then making a kind of solo game and why did you decide to choose solo rather than a, a multiplayer board game? So, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Basically, um, I've, I've, I never really, I didn't know solo player for board games ever existed. It was, wasn't something that I ever really looked at, but um, I've, I've got games like Twilight Imperium, Scythe, um, Cosmic Encounter, Anachrony, uh, all the different types of risks that you can that you can imagine, and um, my my girlfriend at, at this at the time this is maybe about about probably about sort of three or four years ago, she um she didn't want to play any board games ever, which was like massively like difficult for me because like I used, I get the the like the itch to play a complex board game like pretty much most evenings, and um, I thought all right well what is she into okay she's into Lord of the Rings I know what I'll do I'll get her the Lord of the Rings the card game for Christmas and then we can both play it yeah what a great idea and. Uh, the board game just stayed on that shelf for months and months and months and months and months. It never never came off the shelf. And then eventually when she moved out, the board game stayed there on the shelf. And uh, I, I was like, oh. And then when I moved house, I like had the board game in my hand. And I noticed on the board game that it had the one to two players. I just thought, one player? Cut a long story short. I go go to my flat, I, I, my new flat. I throw a log on the fire. I get, the, I get the, uh, the Fellowship of the Ring soundtrack on the sound system playing. And I'm like, all right, let's give this a go. So I start playing the Lord of the Rings, a card game on my own with the soundtrack being played. And it was immersion just like just like a computer game, just like, like playing Morrowind or something like that. It was absolutely wonderful. And I just thought, this is, there's something in this. And my, my favorite subgenre is cyberpunk. Yeah. And I just thought, right, how do I make this for cyberpunk? Like, how, do, how can that... I looked everywhere. I looked at games like Netrunner. I looked at games that are, that are out there that, that are big, big cyberpunk kind of style games. But there was no soundtracks that I could really marry quite right, like quite well with. Like Vangelis is so connected to Blade Runner. You're not, you know, so I, I, it never really quite connected. So I thought, right, I'm going to 
do this. I'm going to make an actual like pixel art 8-bit style um, game, mix it in with 8-bit sort of chip tune kind of music that then morphs into like 64-bit using FL Studio and stuff that kind of goes more into this sort of synth wave, vapor wave, that kind of style, um, like Aphex Twin kind of stuff as well. And, and just kind of like create like a really immersive cyberpunk single player game. And I've and I've done it, and I'm like, ooh, this is good. <laughs> well, I know your day job. I mean, obviously, you know, stories and narrative, it, it's kind of second nature to you. I mean, you, you're a film producer for Pinewood Studios, aren't you? Yes, I work at the Liftoff Global Network at Pinewood. I'm actually the second person you've ever had on your show that's been in a Star Wars film. Yeah, I was. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I was a stormtrooper in Rogue One, which is pretty cool. But yeah. they cut. But they cut our scene, which is annoying. <laughs> so like, I'm in the I'm in the Blu-ray extras. But yeah, that's um. Yeah, every now and then the, the lovely people at LucasArts are like, we need extras. And uh, that's when uh, the people in our office are kind of like sticking their noses out being like, we'll help. Well, as we're pledging on Kickstarter, you always kind of get rewards and you've got some pretty awesome rewards, including kind of a character creation day at Pinewood Studios, which yes. sounds well good fun. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, we've got, Pinewood is a working studio, as you can, you can imagine. So there's like there's golf buggies driving around all the time. There's producers everywhere. You've got the Carrie Fisher building that's just been built up on the opposite side of the of the of the lot. You've got all the old stuff where all the Carry On films were filmed. You've got the garden where Mary Poppins and and um, what's his name, the chimney guy. Oh, Is Dick it? Van Dyke. I can't Dick remember. Van Dyke. Yeah, yeah. You've got where they were prancing around at the beginning and stuff. You've got the gardens there. You you lit, you're literally like, oh my god, it's this place. Oh my god, it's that place. The beginning of Eyes Wide Shut when Nicole Kidman and Tom Cruise walking past that big long mirror. That I like walk through that every day. It's pretty damn cool, and it's um. It's it's nuts. We've had a we've had a few we've had a few people come over and like um, have a look at the office and stuff and look at where we're situated and everything and they've always been blown away and every now and then you get to see like a tie fighter go past the window or you get wow. to see like <laughs> like Millennium Falcon like wrapped in tarpaulin and like the tarpaulin like blows away and you're like oh, it's the Millennium Falcon. It's <laughs> like and they're sh- they're shooting the new Bond now or doing principal photography so there's and the sets are a lot more open so you can kind of like have a little wander around and it's quite cool. So we're offering that to people that pledge that want to come and hang out in our in our little cinema that we've got at Pinewood and do do some character creation on the screen and and go through some bits and bobs so I can help them create their card and and we do a little uh, unofficial tour of Pinewood and uh, yeah it's, it's, it should be a really fun should be a really fun day. And it's no surprise at all to see that you uh, have reached your uh, your goal already with still two weeks left on it. But um, obviously, I imagine after hearing this, loads of people are going to be rushing to uh, your Kickstarter to have a look at it. And I, I think it looks so. awesome as well. I mean, what does Civitas Nihilium mean? OK, so it's a it's a play on Latin. It's, right. an, it's an idea that in this dimension, in the Civitas Nihilium 2D dimension, the um, the 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 Latin has kind of gone in a, in a bit of a strange direction. But Civitas still means city and nihilium means nothing so it's city of nothing and um that's a little insight into the kind of the way that the story sort of arcs within the game itself there's several different story layers within the game so while you're playing it you get to see like oh the transhumanists what what's their agenda and you le- you learn a little bit more about them and then you kind of learn a little bit more about the glee heads that are like a narcotics gang there's loads of different factions there's cults that are like that, that, that are obsessed with the three-dimensional dimensions. There's, um, there's, there's people that are obsessed with kind of um, a mortality, becoming a mortal, and dudes like FM2030 or like these big-time transhumanists that have come out of cryogenic suspension. It's all very, very, very geeky. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how we love it. <laughs> yeah, <I guess. laughs> Well, James, it's incredible that you're doing this project. I mean, it looks so well made from what we've seen on Kickstarter. Oh, and um, so we much. wish you all the best with it. We'll put a link in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Uh, thank you for coming on and keep up the good work. My absolute, absolute pleasure. I'm, I'm, I'm really, really honoured that you guys had me on the show. Thank you. Let's talk about this lost NES wrestling game that's yeah. been digitised. So we, we, we talk a lot about these kind of lost games and this one's really interesting. You, you know about wrestling, don't you, Joe? Sure. Do you, a, a, a little wrestling bit. Fan back in the, do you know, I remember uh, WWF. I was well, do you know that. what UWC is? Well, no, I always thought WCW was, you know, the, uh, the, the younger brother, but what's... UWC was the UWC. placeholder name put in uh, for WCW during oh. the purchase in 1988. Oh, uh, okay. So this was a game that was given to a Nintendo employee because he was a fan of wrestling. So 30 years ago, he was given a copy of this kind of full-produced game. 
And then a YouTuber called Stephen Reese managed to get hold of the game. And he's kind of looked into it, and they've managed to actually get it digitally preserved, and they've got a copy out there. And they're saying there's lots of different things they've been able to add to it. So originally in the game, it didn't have title screen at the end. So okay. no one actually got credit for this game. Right. So they've managed to add that in. They've started looking at stuff like crowd faces in the game as well. Yeah, they're trying to fix them because of uh, they're pretty... Uh... Jaunty. <laughs> <Yeah>. Scary, <laughs> I was going to say. terrifying. <laughs> and it's been developed by a Japanese studio called Sita. Uh, I'm not okay. sure if you've heard of that. No, that, I don't was know for, it. that was for the NAS, and it was out in 1989. I love the fact they look like, you know, proper, proper like beefcakes as well, the wrestlers, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Even the referee is pretty wham. <laughs> and his arms are pretty... moustaches. Yeah. <laughs> and it's kind of strange that you've got a game to this tiny placeholder this tiny little period but when it changed to wcw you know yeah and the graphics actually look pretty cool for the nez i think i was gonna say it looks like they might have smoothed them out a bit but it's it's pretty nice looking other than the crowd but the uh (laughs) the main sprites look nice i wonder how well it plays yeah Mm. that's kind of the the true test yeah they've got uh, some footage on youtube but um they're kind of hoping to fully release it and uh the, the, these guys are helping them, the Video Game History Foundation. Cool. So. It's always good when like unreleased games kind of get spread to a wider audience and you can download them on your EverDrive and play them, you know. it's uh, I, I love discovering, like, you know, kind of lost stuff like that. It's really yeah, cool. and it's kind of mad that someone just went, oh, you're a wrestling fan, have this. Yeah. <laughs> this We've made a game for you. Yeah. <laughs> I found this in my attic. <laughs> <laughs> now, before we get into our chat with uh, John Robertson about The Dark Room, this is a really good interview this week, let's talk a bit about Blockbuster. Now, we've all got memories of Blockbuster, haven't we? What, what, Rest in peace. <laughs> Friday nights. Do you remember that smell when you walked into Blockbuster? I just, I used to love going into Blockbuster, trying to find what PlayStation game my cousin can copy for me. <laughs> 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 when am I going to rent this week and get copied illegally? <laughs> um, you know, I miss Blockbuster. It's just, I don't know, it's just something magical about it. Yeah. It, it, it also kind of attracted movie people. So my mate, he was really into films and directing and all of this stuff. And he'd got his job spare time at Blockbuster. And yeah. he'd just stand there chatting about movies all day. Mm. There'd kind of be movie people around them. I always thought that, you know, when I was like getting into my teens, I always thought a great job would be working at Blockbuster. Yeah. Probably wasn't at all. Minimum like, wage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like you get to watch movies all day. Rewinding like, yeah. videotapes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you remember you'd have to like put them through that letterbox? Yeah, on the side. Well, yeah. I'd yeah. always do that because it, like, it would always be returned late and it'd be like, well, I'll put it through the letterbox and they'll never know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they always knew. <laughs> they always knew. <laughs> and that, I always remember, like, you know, I, I wasn't, I've never been that much of like, you know, a, a movie snob, you could say. My main memories of like Blockbuster are going there with my mate Neil and we'd get like, you know, a big two litre bottle of full fat Coke. Yeah. Big bag of popcorn, sweets, bag of munchies and all that. Sit there watching like, dude, where's my car? I yeah. like a Friday night. And, but it was great memories. And the thing is, we know they all closed down in the last decade. Um, I think the nearest one to me in West Bridgeford went probably about 2011, 2012. Yeah. And there was actually two left in the world. Now, one of them was in Australia, and that is going to be closing down next week. So the last video rental store called Blockbuster in Australia with the logo outside and everything's gone means there's now just one Blockbuster video store in the entire world. And that is based in Oregon. In Bend, Oregon. Yeah. So, I mean, this place apparently, I've been reading, you know, stuff on Reddit and Twitter and stuff, people have been there. Apparently it's like a time capsule from like 1998. Yeah. So they did a documentary on Vice about it. It's in the show notes. We'll add it. And uh, they basically went to Bend and they looked at this last blockbuster yeah and they actually revealed some quite interesting things because there's no one from blockbuster head office or anything so how are they meant to get the new videos well how do they how do they get the new she just goes to asda and buys (laughs) them oh really walmart yeah there's no like head office or anything anymore she just has it's just just owns the front like yeah yeah she's like a franchise store franchisee and she's just still front yeah franchisee and she's just and, and they're saying in there that's a labour of she love, was saying in the is. Vice film she was saying don't film me because I've got to go and buy these Blu-rays from like Walmart <laughs> and then list them up but she still says actually with the algorithms at the moment on Netflix you don't you, you're getting a choice but it's a curated choice if you go there you get a curated choice but it's created by a human rather than a computer yeah, yeah. so it's a lot more mm. kind of wider ranging and they still had nice stuff like um films of the month 
and yeah. stuff like that. You know, staff picks. Well, from what I've seen of it, it's essentially like a like a, a mom and pop kind of video store with a blockbuster name, isn't it? Yeah, but it's yeah. quite big. Mm. Yeah, and they seem to be doing okay. I think you know, from two things I've seen from what they do, they don't just do new movies either. They do a lot of stuff that you won't find on Netflix, like classic films. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. also they... Uh, like you said, they get a lot of tourists going there who want to kind of go to Blockbuster again one more yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, just buy something or get yeah. a big, big bag of Doritos. And, that, and they say that Bend is a small place as well, so that's kind of something to do, isn't it? To yeah, go to Blockbuster cool. and I guess a smaller community would keep habits like that. Where I wonder if they still say, sell 80s horror movies to underaged teenagers well, for a pound well, they, <laughs> the coolest you thing you did that as well didn't you <laughs> yep <laughs> you can go in and get like a blockbuster membership card yeah oh, and, like wow. proper sign up and everything oh. <laughs> can I have it laminated please yeah. <laughs> long may it continue as well I think that's really cool the last one standing there's been like hundreds of thousands of them in the world like 20 years ago mental yeah I think they said in the video that there was four in that town originally and yeah. like one left to, uh, oh, rest in peace blockbuster off in this one store stay open from ever over, I want to go visit now it sounds cool so if you want to read about that and everything else we've talked about this week, I'll put all of those stories in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, before we get into our chat with John Robertson, just time to give a big thank you and a mention to our good friends at The Economist. Now, The Economist have been really big supporters of the Retro Hour podcast over the last few months. And we actually would like to give you a free print copy of The Economist for yourself. Now, The Economist is the smart guide to the forces impacting your world. And it's about a lot more than just economics and finance as well. It covers stuff like politics to business, science, technology, and even gaming as well. Now, we're reading this article that came out this month in The Economist. It's all about kids. It's kind of um, couch potatoes versus esports enthusiasts. Because it's kind of saying, you know, if you're a parent and you've got, you know, maybe a typical kid who comes home from school, hunched over their console, headset on, talking to friends, playing games, why not take them to a competitive video gaming event? Yeah, at least they'll be socialising. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but also I, I think as games are kind of changing and more adaptive with technologies, you know, stuff like VR is really making fitness levels go up. Well, they're talking as well about how big esports are now. And I mean, you know, some of these, you watch them, they're, they're in proper stadiums. They're, they're actually done like a, you know, something like, it could be like a, a wrestling championship or the World Cup or something. Oh, yeah. Huge. So, so League of Legends, yeah. I, I, I saw one where they basically had a, a full training camp where they had these guys in China, they were sitting there every day getting up, sitting in these gaming seats, gaming but they also had like supplements yeah so they were eating these kind of nutrients to get their fingers to go faster i need to get my clicks quicker yeah. <laughs> finger roids yeah <laughs> oh man but i mean you know that, that event you mentioned then league of legends they, they did one tournament where a hundred million people were watching live yeah it's absolutely insane it's and, real. And, you yeah. know you're probably getting more viewers of that than you are some traditional sports yeah boxing matches and stuff like that so it's mm. massive so the economist i mean teaches you stuff like this lets you know what's going on in the world around you and and this world that we live in now, you know, real facts and a trustworthy source is more important than ever. And they've been going over 170 years. So if you're the kind of person who never stops asking questions, you want to know why the world is the way it is, then definitely worth having a look at The Economist. Now, we've actually got a little offer for you here. If you claim this, you'll be really helping out the podcast as well. And you will get a free print copy of The Economist in the post. All you have to do is text the word retro and send that to 78070. So that's retro to 78070 for your free print copy of The Economist, the smart guide to the forces changing your world. Right then, that's all the news we've got for this week. There will be more on next Friday's show. And right now, let's get into our guest this week, the amazing John Robertson. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time to welcome this week's very special guest, the man behind the dark room. Welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, John Robertson. Aha, thank you. What a joy. <laughs> well, John, let's get a bit of background on kind of where all this came from. I mean, I, I did read you were a fan of the fighting fantasy books. Um, well, the the odd thing, actually, is um, I, I never saw a fighting fantasy book when I was a kid. But I met, I met Ian Livingstone when I was doing The Dark Room uh, live at the Edinburgh Fringe. And he came up to me and said, hello, my name's Ian. And I invented uh, the genre you're parodying, which I think is one of the best introductions you can have to a human being. And then we went out for lunch one time. We had a lovely time and we just talked about it. And eventually, because, yeah, eventually we kind of figured out that I, I had encountered, um, you know, some books, some fighting fantasy books, but like they had been an unconscious influence over the course of years. I, you know, it was only, the, let's put it this way. The UK has a great and ferocious lust 
for a lot of um, lot of interactive medieval fantasy that maybe didn't make it all the way down to Australia, like like not in a well known brand way. But then I was sitting there and I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I specifically played Death Trap Dungeon when I was a boy, but I remember being killed. So what systems and kind of what text adventures and games were popular in Australia? Well, n- now you're asking the wrong man to tell you what was popular. Uh, because, I mean, in Australia, you've got to understand that text adventures were never popular and the people who played them uh, were roundly beaten with stones. Um, you know, Australia, when I was growing up, was a place for um, heterosexual people who surfed. Uh, but the games that I played, uh, I I found, like me and my mate Tom in year five, we found a, a derelict computer in the uh, storeroom behind our classroom and we, we fixed it up and we managed to get a game running with, that seemed to put you in a cave. But um, the best part about it was that it was faulty. And uh, so anything you did would just slowly murder you. Um, my favourite was um, read map and then it would just say you grow weaker. And you could read that map until you eventually died. And we never solved the problem. Uh, and it was only, I only really played text adventures um, that I knew by name. I only really played them as an adult. Um, the Dark Room is more of a response to chancing upon a whole bunch of them when I was a kid and not knowing what was going on and being utterly terrified and confused. So I remember those text adventures could be brutal. I, I think I played um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and if you, know, you yeah. brush your teeth in the wrong way or something, the house would collapse right. and you'd die. Yeah, I played that, I played that once, I'd, um, once I'd already made Darkroom because uh, people, I mean, Douglas Adams, obviously, well, was a genius and I had loved every other format of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, so why I was late to the game, I'll never understand. Um, and uh, Zork, oddly enough, um, when Darkroom came out, people started messaging me going, oh, you're about to be eaten by a Gru, you're about to be eaten by a Gru. And I recognised the reference, but I'd come to Zork in the oddest way because I'd come via 1998's hideous gothic um, FMV interactive movie um, Zork Nemesis, which oh, wow. is kind of like an appallingly violent mist clone. Well, did you ever make any of your own text adventures? I remember we had an old program and I made one where uh, politicians were chasing you down hallways. So it's like, you know, Margaret Thatcher and oh, John Major to... and stuff. <laughs> well, let's see. Um, when I was at school, we um, we programmed a bit in QBasic and I eventually made, as we all did, a um, very enjoyable square that really moved um, a fair bit. And mine went right off the screen, as I recall. Um the first person I knew who actually managed to make their own text adventure game was Tom, uh, who had gone out, you know, come with me out the back and played this appalling cave game. And Tom, I, I didn't realize this, Tom had um, created a text adventure apparently specifically to prank me uh, because anything I would try to do, it would quite frustratingly say, I don't, uh, I don't recognize that as a verb. You know, you make a point there about kind of the way you talk to adventure games as well, because I remember those early language passes, you know, they were often, you'd have to be very specific with the way that you talk to them as well, wouldn't you? Oh, absolutely. It was like learning a completely different language, but just, you know, but that's what made it, made it so wonderfully frustrating. (laughs) You know, it's like, I know how to order a burger at McDonald's. Why can't I tell you to let me go and pick up the torch? Well, I mean, did you get shows like Nightmare in, in no. Australia? Were they no, over No, we never had Nightmare okay. in Australia. Um, the thing is, when I, when I first came um, to this country and people were talking about Nightmare, I thought they were talking about this um, board game that came with a VHS tape that my father and I had played once. And then I realised that it had a K on it, and the thing I was thinking of is called atmosphere over here. Yeah, but it was it was interesting to me because I really liked hearing all of these UK accents raving about Nightmare. When my strongest memory of the game is us having the expansion called Nightmare Two: Baron Samity, and my father, who was an Anglican priest who wasn't a profane man, getting sick of it at one point and just saying, "Yes, Baron Samity, you're a head. Goodbye," and just leaving the room. <laughs> Well, how did you end up getting started in comedy then? I, well, I'd, uh, I had uh, gone through um, high school and uh, finished it, and that, w- that seemed to be its purpose. And then uh, I was told that, you know, now that you've done that, you should go to university. And I went to, a, um, I went to the Curtin University of Technology uh, because they apparently had a fantastic uh, drama, cl- drama course. Um, I, <laughs> I will point out that they did have a fantastic drama course for the first six months that I was there and then they decided they were going to sell the theatre so you know we were the only drama course that took place entirely in the foyer of a building that was being sold um 
but yeah, I um I'd originally decided I was going to be an actor, but uh, for as as luck would have it, I I enrolled in the wrong classes. So uh, when I showed up on my first day of uni, a very tall woman uh, by the name of Mel came and greeted me and said, uh, "Your name is John," and she, as it turns out, knew me from watching me and my friends hang out and just be stupid down at the local anime society. And uh, we hung out for a long time, and she told me that I should do stand-up and never, you know, let, make, make no mistake, there's very few things uh, that I won't do to impress women I like. And so I went straight into it, and that's what happened. Well, I mean, I even heard you were on Australian Idol as well, and you caused them um, a bit of a stir on there. Yes, I did. Um, yes, I, I, you know, it was a bit of a lark. I went down, I wrapped myself in the Australian flag. I wore a very fetching uh, skivvy and um, cream chino and black and white sneakers combination with my long, greasy 17-year-old hair um, pulled back to fully reveal the extent of my acne. And I, um, yeah, I sang about, about a quarter second of an Australian song about the war dead, um, and then began singing the trash man surf and bird with bad, 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 because the bad is the word. Um, <laughs> and I, yeah, as I did that, I spasmed on the ground and, um, you know, had a, had myself a, uh, a deliberate uh, sort of um, imitation epileptic fit and just really just, you know, hammered my body and smashed myself and a lot of, you know, really, really appalling attempted break dancing. It's kind of like, you know, like Douglas Adams would say that in order to fly, you throw yourself at the ground and miss Right. Whereas I was just sort of throwing myself at the ground and then bouncing myself up from the force. And yeah, um, yeah, they played that on TV 12 times. So mission accomplished for me. Did you make it through to the judge's house's stage of, um, of, of, of Idol? There's a judge's house stage? <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to lie. I think the only the close I got to a judge's house <laughs> was probably around, you know, about halfway through the um, the clip, which you can see on YouTube. It's um, Australian Idol Audition plus Bird is the Word is what it's called. You can see uh, the the act Marsha Hines uh, just start to freak out about half halfway through my my little set, and uh, I was told later by a contestant that I'd given her nightmares, which um, I still I'm still quite proud of, really. So, would you describe your comedy as kind of uh, surreal or dark? Or? Um, well, it's it's gone through a lot of stages. Um, I would the word I currently use is anarchy, and I, I appreciate that I'm sounding pretty, you know, pretty genteel and chilled out on this thing. But you know, I'm not on stage, and there aren't two hundred of you, and you don't need to be screamed at. Yeah, I, I, what I, what I wanted to do when I started doing stand up was just go out and say whatever I felt like, right? And after sixteen years, I can go out. And I can say whatever I feel like and I can play with the people who are in the room and we can have ourselves a really wild sort of crowd surfy, put people on my shoulders, throw people around time. And my the things that amuse me are darker than things that may amuse other people. And fortunately, my, my audience tend to be into that. And because, you know, the, the nice thing as well is, I mean, I'll be 34 this year. And so now if I if I make a dark joke, please understand, you know, like it's either been honed and well crafted or it's based on something I've actually lived through. You know what I mean? We've we've really gotten through the 19-year-old, yeah, I'm going to talk about 9-11, that's edgy, pow, pow, kind of phase. You know what I mean? So kind of when there's comedy and computer games, you know, I've not yeah. seen that many amazingly well done kind of versions. Why did you decide to do The Dark Room but also take it onto stage? Uh, well, um, we had done, we'd done really well. Uh, well, I, well, it was originally a joke. It was a joke I'd done on stage, uh, which was cool. And then um, that just worked one day, on, on the day it was meant to. You know, I was at an anime convention, I was in front of 2,000 people, and they just lost their minds for this stupid little five-minute routine to the point that we turned off all the lights in the theatre and it became a 45-minute long just impro you know it was great and when i got home people were doing like people were sending me fan art of me in a dark room and all this stuff it was super cool and then um a bloke said to me you know oh you should put it on youtube and i figured out that the annotations can be used to click around so off i went and uh yeah we made a a viral viral youtube game which was 2012 levels of viral so i um i'm out of money i'm not gonna lie it did not last and do you find that the audience really take to it? Because when I was younger, if, if I was playing a computer game and something funny would happen, that would probably be the funniest moment of my life. And I'd just be 
laughing on the floor for like you know yeah. a good 10 20 minutes like do you find that people kind of go back to that young young mode when they're in a text adventure yeah yeah absolutely man um yeah i mean in the live show um from feedback that we've had you know playing you know with people playing the game for some reason there's just something very very funny about a computer program telling you a funny thing and i say that as someone who before we <laughs> before we did this i um i may have spent the last half hour uh, sitting downstairs with my housemate, um, writing offensive things on a text-to-speech messenger and uh, just sending them to each other. So, uh, you know, which which was very funny when I was 12 and hasn't stopped. Well, on the YouTube version, I read, you know, something like 0.04% of players actually made it to this good ending that's in there. I've got, um, I, st- I think I have the last surviving um, one of the promotional dog tags we gave out. And you can tell that it was 2012 because what what it says is we are the 0.0001%. So there you go. A uh, a joke about Occupy, which couldn't possibly date now, could it? <laughs> so. Well, have you ever revealed the solution to it then, or is that like... No, okay. no. And and now now YouTube's gone along and uh, removed all annotations, so the original version of the game is no longer playable. But that's okay, um, you know, because we have the Skype game. What's it, the Skype game? The Steam game. Wow. Wow. I remember when I was 10 and I used to just attack my mother for making mistakes like that. So <laughs> watch out. That's why we're not having kids. Sorry, mum. I'm going to hurt you both ways. Um, yeah, just all of that. Sorry, I forgot where that was going. I just had a just having a conversation with my mother about these. I, I don't think she knows she's not getting grandchildren. And I don't know why I told you. Breaking news on the, on the <laughs> yeah. Retro Hour podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, she listens to these things. She listens. Is he brushing his teeth? Is he doing well? Is he talking nicely to the young men? Good. Um, yeah, is that I think I think your mum listens to the podcast, doesn't she, Ravi? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There you go. See. Oh, that's good. That's, that's nice. <laughs> There's well, lots, look, of, my, lots yeah. of mums keeping an eye. Yeah, my, my <laughs> mum doesn't know what the podcast is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we, you know, the strangest thing is, have you have you done some demographics? Have you discovered that the audience is principally your mothers or just other people's mums? <laughs> I think like we have a four percent female following, and yeah. that's probably oh. my mum. <laughs> that, that, that they're four percent female. That's nice. That's that's kind of, that's kind of advice. Um, that, yeah, well, it's kind of regressive. I'm more female than that. Um, the yeah, the the weird thing I found is that um, depending on various towns I go, the nature of my demographic changes. And um, I it was only I think it was a couple of years ago that I quite heartbreakingly got from a nice person. Um, they came up and went, "My mum loves you," and it was that moment going, "I'm not for her." <laughs> and then you're sort of like. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. You know, it's it's a nice little discovery. But then also, I, I reached the age where a couple a couple of years ago, I was trying to figure out, you know, like how old I was, not by you know just 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 in general. And I watched American Beauty, and this is before the thing with Kevin Spacey, and I realised that I now found the teenage children annoying. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Rather than sort of being like, my God, they're so oppressed. I realised I found the daughter desperately irritating and that was when you know and i was starting to sympathize with the parents and that was when i was like oh, okay i'm in my 30s now of course now you know kevin spacey's ruined that movie for everybody so um goodbye annette benning's finest performance nevertheless well whereabouts are you kind of based because i i know you're talking about australia but we met in the mm-hmm. uk and i guess you've yep. been able to take this dark room all around the world have you i have yeah but i mean uh, yeah you're not you're not like reaching me in far flung desert land Australia. We're not out in Mad Max country, you know. Like you have, uh, you have reached me here in London, which is where I'm based. But yeah, I'm um, darkroom. Done a lot of Southeast Asia. We've gone through Europe a bit. I'm going to the Utrecht Comedy Festival fairly soon. Um, you know, I have gone to a lot of places uh, with an enormous bag containing armor uh, covered with spikes and. A lot of equipment that really looks like explosives, you know. Uh, so that's been a lot of fun. But yeah, we're everywhere. Um, I, I normally summarise it as like we've played theatres in London and a burger joint in Cambodia, which is true. <laughs> well, I mean, you are going to be back at um, Play Expo in Manchester um, this summer if people I want to come along. I, um, I mean, do, do you find that the the, the dot room appeals to like retro gaming and video game fans? Absolutely. I mean, that's that's you know that's who it's for. I am a gamer. We all grew up with this stuff, you know. We've got generations coming up, growing up with, you know, new exciting games that sometimes we can see off the back. And, you know, I've sat down a few times where, you know, somebody's telling me about this new exciting game and I'm like, Jesus, I remember that from 25 years ago, you know. (laughs) 
is that game so old that they've stopped putting numbers after it? Now it's just the original title again, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, and specifically, specifically um, UK, UK gaming people just really, really dig it. You know, you've got a fantastic culture of retro gaming in this country. It really makes me happy. Well, have you taken any elements from those kind of classic adventure games? Well, there are elements in the sense that there are death traps and elements in the sense that you don't really know uh, what's going on. I mean, I, I mean, I, I feel I feel because the question earlier was about um, it was about text adventures. I feel I might have misled you because I was a big apogee boy when I was younger, and I don't mean I don't mean apogee moving towards its time as three D realms. I mean Commander Keen. And um, Crystal Cave was it? yeah, Crystal Caves and Halloween Harry, and uh, which I think was Alien Carnage in this country, mm-hmm. you know, and, and things like that. And I remember at least one one of my various grandparents had a I think oh god he had the Romancing the Stone game, where you could be afflicted with baldness, so you had to go back and pick up your hat all the time, otherwise you would be bald and lose a point of health. <laughs> and yeah, stuff like that continues to tickle me. You know, like I like I like things that are established yet arbitrary and painful to the player. That's the sort of thing I enjoy. Your um your Sierra point and click adventures, for instance, you know? Yeah, I think that's it. Do you think that's kind of missing a bit from games today? Yeah, a little bit. Um, you know, like I remember becoming incredibly angry. This is when Dark Ring first came out. I was uh what was I playing? Oh, I was playing LA Noir, you know, a game that would have been better as a point and click adventure. And uh I remember I had crashed the car during a particular scene three times. And so the game said, this message just appeared and it just said, you look like you're having trouble with this bit. Would you like to skip it? Now, there are some players, obviously, for whom this would seem like a fantastic piece of accessibility and good. And to be honest, I did skip the thing because I was getting very bored of doing the same thing over and over and over again. But it made me a a little angry because... For instance, say uh, playing Police Quest, where oh, you uh, you got in the car without examining all of the tires. The game is over, you know. And it was my it was my first time of being like, well, hold on, my generation did it harder than this generation that's coming in, you know. Which, bearing in mind that you know two generations ago my family went to war, and then my you know father was raised by parents who had gone to war, and so we're a little more brutal than perhaps we would have liked. And uh, my generation can look at the generation beneath us and go, you think you know what's hard in video games. It, it was strange with me as well, because I'd, I'd play and you'd have restrictions on these games, like with point mm. and click and kind of uh, the Sierra games that you mentioned. Like Legend Suit Larry, I remember one, sure, where yeah. you'd be on a date, blind date game, and you could type anything you want. So you could be like, oh, you're completely ugly, I hate you. And she'd be like, oh, nice yeah. <laughs> nice comments, Larry. And it was like you had this kind of set strictness, but there was also yep. a lot more freedom to mess about in them. Yeah, messing around is is a beautiful thing. I mean, like, so okay, any time I see a YouTube clip of, like, multiplayer gaming, I see people who have messed around with physics and they've had the most wonderful time. You know, and I remember... My friend Tom had a mate called Max who had a copy of Unreal and he had the Unreal level editor and we messed around with the gravity and we killed all of these spiritual aliens and sent them up, sent them flying up into the air, you know, and just had the most wonderful time doing that. So there's a lot of there's a lot of visual creativity going on. But there's not so much just playing with language and that that bothers me a bit. Well, talking about the stage version of the darkroom then, for people that haven't come along and experienced it, I mean, how does it actually work and do you get many winners? Because I know you can win money playing it, can't you? Oh, you can. You can win money. And uh, so help me God, what a lucky boy I am that only two (laughs) people have won since 2012, back when the jackpot was 50 quid and not the thousand that it is now. Um, What happens is you come in and you've got to remember the darkroom on stage is a live action text adventure. It's a live action video game. So all the lights go down. Um... I will suddenly appear in a blaze of uh, tremendously cheap eBay lights and, uh, you know, you'll hear the phrase, you are weak to find yourself in a dark room. Then uh, four options appear on the screen. We get uh, a member of the audience to call out the options they want. That they proceed until they die or win. And then we'll do that. We do that a few times. Then we get a couple of people to play. Then we get the whole audience to play together. And it is the way to spend time. Now it's kind of gone full circle. Uh, so is it an actual video game or what, what is it then now? It's a kind of interactive performance? 
it's it's both um yeah the it's uh well let's put it this way whenever we need a government grant it's an interactive performance um but yeah yeah i mean the darkroom live show is an interactive performance the darkroom game on steam is a video game and uh yeah yeah actually actually to be fair though no because i'm quite sick at the moment so i am subject to a virus so maybe it has actually become a video game and it does glitch yeah <laughs> you, you know what you've you've un- you've you've turned my reality upside down <laughs> my god my god this is wonderful i'm so pleased that i'm in a video game and it's not firewatch jesus <laughs> <laughs> i mean i enjoyed firewatch but god could you imagine living it yeah there, there's, there's one thread i saw on, on facebook the other day someone was like yeah the, the last game you played you have to live in now for the, for the next week what was it and uh yeah i think some guy said mortal Kombat, which uh wouldn't be yeah. the nice way to spend a week even lemmings would be brutal wouldn't yeah, it oh, god. oh jesus <laughs> of course of course. I mean, well, unfortunately, I was just playing. Um, <coughs> I was just playing Mortal Kombat. So, whoops, that's that's me done. Um, but you know, I'd, I I'd be okay. I could I could wear Sindel's costume. We've got the same hair. It was um, you know, the characters from Mortal Kombat Three were in there. I'll be fine. Well, the Dark Room's obviously been a, a big success on the you know live version of it. So it has gone full circle. I mean, you've you've made yeah. an actual video game about this now. I mean, why did you just decide to do that, and how did it kind of happen? I'd, I'd wanted I'd wanted to make a game for a while, and then um, then it turned out that oh yeah, and that was it. I approached um, Stirfire Studios in in Perth, in Western Australia, a, a very fine company made up of people that I've known since I was about fourteen, and then they came back later on, thanks to my friend John, uh, they who's been I'm, I cannot lie, my mate John Hayward has been nothing but invaluable for the life of the dark room. He is. Oh my god! Any time there's a technical issue, he fixes it up. He's the producer of the Darkroom game. He's bloody amazing, is John. And um, they wanted to make a game uh, just using mocap, right? And so it made sense to take a, a live performance and a really vigorous and engaging one, and see what we could do. So that's um, yeah, that's that's how that came about. And then we we did it and i you know like in that week that we we did the mocap and i screamed out three hours worth of technology or oh, three hours worth of technology yeah sure why not uh do you know three hours worth of blood and thunder and all this stuff you know i'm not gonna lie i ruptured myself so that was fun <laughs> i'd like to thank the nhs for the hernia surgery i had just before christmas <laughs> yeah, it, uh, is that when you got all those like little dots on your face and it's got a you've got to kind of i imagine it's a long process doing motion capture uh, well, it's a lot longer uh, for, uh, there's a lovely lady called Jess, and it was a lot longer for Jess, who had to draw wireframes upon my face and literally play connect the dots with me. And the camera was right up my nose for the facial capture the entire time. And, you know, like, she could always tell the takes where we just had lunch because there's, like, bits of gristle in my teeth. You know, so that that poor lady, she did a stellar job capturing what she captured and so did um so did the artist lisa who um ah oh, jesus i hesitate to count the amount of hours that they had to watch footage of me you know i mean i was i wrote the thing i was only there a week those are the guys who really did the hard yards and the graphical style of it as well i mean it kind of reminds me of you know it's obviously a lot more high res than the the games back in the late 90s but that kind of aesthetic looks a bit like kind of n64 kind of era a little bit kind of retro inspired yeah yeah it is well that that's exactly it you know like i got oh, this is a few years ago um i discovered that the company bio that had been written for me um when i was working for a particular production company as a presenter described me as king of the 90s john robertson which I think was meant to be an insult in some way, but at the same time, god damn, we were well served by video game consoles in the 90s. We had a stellar time. PC gaming at the time was fantastic. The internet was still what it was meant to be, you know, a place for pornography and for nerds to talk about things that didn't matter. You know what I mean? That's what it was for. Of course, now, unfortunately, nerds talking uh, to each other and getting angry has become a type of business, which is no fun. Anyway. Well, how was the first part received by all the fans then? What was the kind of feedback? Um, the feedback from the game, um, when, it, when it first came out, um, we, got, we got a bit of mixed feedback initially um, from two, I don't know, like one reviewer and then another thing. But then we, we discovered, like, I, I, I read one of those reviews and I was just like, oh, he had managed to somehow play the like the first thing that came out and then got sent to press, but not the not the patched version that got played by actual people. Um, wow, wow, 
wow, I just referred to the prayers as not actual people. Wow, Trump, you're really doing a number on me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, people people dug it, you know. And then, like, best of all, like the people the people who knew what it was have enjoyed it and they find it faithful and interesting and they're waiting for levels two and three to come out. And that's beautiful. Like, people people have been nothing but generous and kind with us, and that's great. I mean, last time I checked, we had something like 96%. I mean, you never really want to do this, but we had 96% positive feedback from, like, 78 reviews and, like, three bad reviews. And the bad reviews are two people who didn't like the game, one person who just doesn't work on their computer. Mm. You know, and, like, you can't ask for more than that. It's it's really gorgeous. And even even as well, one thing about the dark room, and, and you have to understand this, if you play my game and and you find yourself annoyed by it and and you write something to me that that's mean or, or it's trying to be funny you know and, or whatever you know but it's it's just trying to be cruel or, or the nice thing is the dark room is actually made it's 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 accomplished its mission which was to deeply irritate you <laughs> so I'm so I'm happy, you know, like I'm just sort of like, there we go. Mission accomplished. Who's going to firebomb the studio? Mission accomplished. Well done. All right. Yeah. And then ring the stir fire guys. You might, you, you guys might want to move. <laughs> <laughs> well, what can we expect from part two then? Are you already like, kind of working on that now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, there's a bit of mutilation, which is fun. Um, there's a, a reference I was that, I, that I've put in there, which no one will get. Like, no one's going to get it. Nobody's going to look at it. Like, people people hopefully will, you know, be into it. And they might, maybe people will, will write to me and go, hey, that's what this is or that's what this is. But I, um, I, won't, I won't name it. But um, there's a lovely, lovely old obscure shooter that I used to really enjoy in the late 90s. And there is a particular trap that's in a couple of the levels. And I, tr- I took that trap and I describe it verbally. And it arrives and it just... Ooh, yeah. I mean, there's it's it's deeply violent. Um, the graphics are probably going to go undergo a deliberate downgrade. That'll be fun uh, because as the dark room continues, the actual game itself becomes progressively iller and starts to deteriorate. So I'm really excited by that. And uh, yeah, there's there's a little you know, let, let, let's put it this way. There's a little bit of um, very plot important um, surgery that's about to happen. So that's good. So by the time we get to part four, it might be like um, ZX Spectrum style graphics. I, I actually, oh my god, I don't mind that. <laughs> That's a good idea. I mean, I mean to be fair, either that or like you've got glaucoma. You know what I mean? Like it should, ju- it should just be either the game is breaking or I am. That's the feeling that we're going for here. Well, you also hosted some uh, video game nation shows as well. Uh, I did. At uh, one did. time, was that like the UK's only video gaming show on TV? You know. It was. It, abs- it absolutely was. There hadn't been um, one of us since. I, I got the impression that it was a, a show in Scotland uh, that was the last one or, or some, something like that. But everyone, everyone talked about Games Master, which was another show that did not make it to Australia. Was it, was it Video Gaiden? That was the Australian. Yeah, uh, that was it. I loved Scottish that Scottish one, yeah. I loved that name because, of course, I, I loved Ninja Gaiden, you know, even though as a child I didn't know how to pronounce it. So I was I was quite smitten by Ninja Gaiden. I'm not going to lie. That was always fun. Well, Video Game Nation was on Challenge, wasn't it? I mean, how did you get that role? Well, um, the lovely thing is never underestimate um, production companies looking for cheap labour and, um, you know, never in turn underestimate your willingness uh, to get your face on television. Uh, what happened was Jinx TV uh, put an ad in a comedian's forum uh, looking for comedians who knew something about video games to come down and um, be on a show they had called Console Yourself. And I did. I went down and they paid me, I think it was something like 50 quid, and I got to be, they filmed me for half an hour and then they cut that up and they used that in every single episode, which was, I was delighted. I mean, you got to understand, I had moved from Australia about a month before, so I was... I was over the bloody moon, you know, like I, I can count my Australian television appearances on three fingers and each one of them is an example as to why I was not invited back by that channel. You know what I mean? So I was happy. And then um, after that, I just kept messaging the director and I went, well, that was fun. What, what, what do we do now? And then he went, oh, well, why don't you come down and do a top top 10? And I was like, I love top 10s. You know, I just started watching a lot of top 10 countdowns on YouTube and then, yeah, that became a segment and then I became one of the hosts and I got to work with Dan and Aoife and it was great and, yeah, it was a really good time. 
They even did a special on the dark room, so you had one episode dedicated to that. Um, no, no, we oh, didn't. I thought you did. Oh, okay. oh, wait, no. Oh, I know, I know what you're saying. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, I, I for for whatever reason, I was I was like imagining it as like a a and now a very special episode of Video <laughs> Game Nation. John Robertson is terminally ill, so we're showcasing his terrible game. <laughs> no, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, no, no. I I know exactly what you meant. My apologies. Um, that was my first appearance on Video Game Nation. Um. The lovely original hosts of the show uh, came down and um, they came down to where we were doing the live show at the time, which was the Gem Bar in Soho. And, um, you know, it, through an afternoon of waiters walking through and wondering what we were doing there and could we leave if possible, um, they yeah, they interviewed me and they were very, very lovely. And then, um, yeah, they, they played the dark room and I gave one of them a dark room shirt and it was really nice. And then I'm not in the episode after that. But then I have a job there, the episode after that, which was a wonderful feeling. You know, it was really good. Well, you mentioned, you know, like um, shows like Games and Master. You said you didn't get that in Australia. But, I mean, that was obviously massive over here in the UK. What was um, gaming <laughs> TV like in Oz then? Was there actually any that you yeah. did watch back then? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a, we had a few a few little shows. Um, a, lot of them, a lot of them made reference to gaming. Like there was Amazing, uh, which I, I, look, just go watch it, all right? It's A asterisk amazing uh, which is very much like a low budget crystal maze like get get rid of anything anything regarding you know like the set you know like just pretty much destroy most of the set make it a maze and make children do it right or or think of it as like nightmare but with less graphics and no, none of the fantasy overtone and it's hosted by a bloke called james sherry who was the first human being i saw on television who i wanted to murder um <laughs> at, at age eight because i was like no no grown man should be that pleased to be anywhere at any time is how i felt about him um but yeah uh we had that and they used to always play um super nintendo games on television which was a wonderful thing because like when i see uh, you know, because I remember when I was hosting Video Game Nation and you would occasionally get a Twitter comment, which was somebody like, can we get real gamers on this show? Uh, he's not good at Halo. Uh, you know, like this kind of thing. But I remember being nine years old and really having an opinion on the children playing Donkey Kong on the screen. You know what I mean? That was Donkey Kong Country is what they were playing. But I was always like, no, no, get on the rhino. Run straight through that thing. Da, ah, there's 50 <laughs> bonus bananas in there. And for me, for me, when I when I think of myself at that age, that's that's sort of exactly what I always think of when I read internet comments. You know, I'm sort of like, oh, okay, you've um, you found an outlet for that because prior to this, the outlet would have just been the empty room you were sitting in. Oh, what a shame! Or telling your mum, yeah, yeah, exactly, like yeah. mum, mum, and then your mother would have said, I don't. You know, and then maybe you could have gone and developed an actual human personality, but that's not important. <laughs> um, we had. Uh, what did we have? Oh, my. Yes. Oh, this is my favorite. We had a show which was entirely paid for by Sega. And uh, it only showcased games on the Mega Drive. And it was hosted by a guy called Muttley. And, yeah, it was just like three kind of um, grungy looking. Yeah, just just like yeah, seriously, like like guys who looked like they'd fallen out of a minor Nirvana clone band. Just kind of sitting around, just being like, hey, you know what's fully radical? Oh, Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition. And Jesus, it was good. I loved that show. They, um, It pretty much existed to advertise the Sega hotline, which you could ring up for tips, mm. uh, you know, for 95 cents a minute. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I lost my parents a lot of money um, trying to find hints on that. Um, oh, God, yeah. Yeah, that was it, because I rented the game The Story of Thor. Did you ever play that? Beyond Oasis, the story of Thor, which is this um, lovely, simplistic Sega JRPG. Um, but yeah, I just it was unlike anything I'd ever seen. And I remember ringing up the Sega hotline and you had to get through, you know, like about three minutes of listening to stuff before you even got to talk to a person. And I remember asking, you know, like, oh, do you have any, do you have any cheats for Beyond Oasis, the story of Thor? And hearing this woman just kind of going through papers and papers and papers. And then she came back with, Oh, we don't have anything for either of those. And at that point, even even at the age of eight or whatever I was, I was like, I've I've picked an obscure game today, you know. So you've been uh, rip, ripped off with a phone call. Oh, bro well, I hadn't been. Your parents. Yeah. <laughs> oh, mum was mum was displeased, as I recall. Um, but yeah, like that was that was pretty much it 
for gaming on Australian TV. I mean, every every kid show felt obliged to include it at one point or another. And we had all of the Sonic the Hedgehog animated series and all of the Super Mario animated series. So lots of advertising, very little criticism. So the perfect seller's market. Well, I mean, do you think it's kind of missing from mainstream TV today or do you think it, it's not needed? I mean, I always think it would be nice to see more gaming on, you know, mainstream television. I think absolutely. Absolutely it would be better to see more uh, more gaming on mainstream television. I mean, they've been stupid, you know, because tele- television as we understand it and what I used to, you know, romanticise heavily was turning on the TV at a particular time to watch a particular thing. You know, I, I have a distinct memory of planning my evenings around when The Simpsons was on, you know, that kind of thing, right? And that's going away, you know, and has been gone for, for a long time. There are, you know, there's a generation coming up that don't really watch television, you know, not not at the t- you know not at one time. They watch it on a catch-up form, whatever it is, you know, however they decide, right? And television's reluctance to embrace gaming is is deeply stupid to me. Because it, it would be like it'd be like the controllers of the BBC in the '60s hearing that this rock music was popular with the children, and deciding, well, let's just never, never do anything. Hmm. You know, let's never do anything at all. It'd be like you know whoever made the old grey whistle test going, no, no, I think I think jazz was probably where it ended. We don't need more. You know what I mean? Like you have to. If when there's a new audience coming up and they're into something, you have to embrace that. And if you embrace it well enough, you'll end up owning and controlling it. You yeah, know? It just feels weird that you know gaming now is like bigger than movies, but it's just not talked about on mainstream TV much at all. It's, it, it's like you said, it's bizarre. Yeah, well, it's one of those things where I mean, it's quote unquote a new art form, and that's baffling to me. You know, because of course it has existed. Oh, well, what's that? probably about 50 years now, you know? Movies hadn't existed 50 years before we had an award ceremony for the best ones, you know? And that one, one that was an award ceremony that was quite noticeably televised everywhere. Um, yeah, I think I, I think some of the reluctance towards it is just, well, it, it becomes an art form that the... Not, not the appeal of it can be difficult to understand because the appeal is evident. You know, it, of course it is. You know, if you love, you know, if you like a bit of visceral violence, here's a thing that can do it for you safely and it looks brilliant and it plays well. I mean, what a wonderful thing to do. Mm. You know you know what I mean? But I, I, I think I think we just, when we, when we consider what art is, we don't yet in the main, well, the mainstream doesn't yet have the language for it. But then the mainstream is going to have a real problem in about, well, I don't know, three to five years when the kids who are playing now, uh, you know, oh, look, suddenly they're all in their late 20s or their mid-20s, you know, and suddenly they're the ones picking everything. We're seeing it right now with, hey, what's that? Superhero movies, you know, they make the most money. Oh, why do they make the most money? Because they're being seen by the gamer people. That's it, you know, that's your audience over there. You know, like, imagine imagine sitting there working in a medium, right? Just like, not, not a genre, just a medium, and then going... Oh, you mean that medium that's a bit similar to this medium is making more money than this thing entirely? Why wouldn't you rush to embrace it? <laughs> I, d- I don't understand. I don't get it at all. Well, thank God for the internet, though. No, no, absolutely <laughs> not. Thank God for the internet. What a... Well, no, no. The, the internet is proof that God has a sense of humour and wishes to watch us <laughs> suffer. God. No, oh, you know, like... the. Tr- for me, the trouble with the internet is the word shut in used to mean something. You know what I mean? Well, John, it has been amazing <laughs> talking to you. Um, some, you know, honestly, we could talk for another two or three hours with you. Um, and I'm sure we will when we, uh, we meet up in Manchester. I mean, where, It would be you... delightful to see you, my friend. <laughs> where are you taking the dark room um, over the next few months? And if people want to come and check it out, is there any, can they get like a list on your website or anything? Oh, they, they absolutely, what, the, the website that I'm constantly updating? <laughs> yes, uh, yes, they can. Um, but I will be at the Sci-Fi Weekend of Sheffield from the 28th to the 31st of March. I'll be at Insomnia 64 from the 19th to the 21st of April. And I will be at Play Expo Manchester from the 4th to the 5th of May. Also at the 6 of 1 Prisoner Convention, but I'm not going to lie, I like the idea that that place is a secret. It's going to be fun. <laughs> well, we'll put, we'll put a link in our show notes to um, your website if people want to check all those out. And, uh, Thank of you course, so much. The game's on Steam as well, if uh, people want to check the game out before they come and see your life. Yeah, that, hey, that'd be a pleasure. Um, just head to www 
www.thedarkroomgame.com and uh, there's all the Steam links that you need and all the descriptions and things like that and you can see my beautifully rendered anime head. Lots of fun. John, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for coming on. Oh, it's been a joy talking to you. Thank you. We'll